Oh uh, yeah, now now now. Yeah. So it's all good. So yeah, it was yeah. really good. Okay, okay. we're getting ready to begin, and we're we're live streaming, so everyone um, come find a seat. Can you pick this again? Okay. Oh, okay. Are they are they checking some students in? I think they're just checking some students in. Okay. Oh, is it for us? I heard from Michael Thurston. You know, two minutes after was our You're usual. You're good whenever you want okay. to start. They're, okay. Um, the live stream will start when you. Okay. Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Is, is the microphone on? All right, do you want to count us down to live streaming? Well, welcome everyone. Welcome, I'm Kathleen McCartney, president of Smith College, and I'm excited to welcome you to what has become a wonderful tradition here at Smith, the annual Elizabeth Miller Lecture. This event is made possible by a gift from Elizabeth Miller, class of 1981, and we are deeply grateful for her generosity. Do you want to just stand up and give a wave, Elizabeth? Thank you so much. <clears throat> I also want to give a special welcome to our keynote speaker, Celeste Gudis from the class of 1980. Now, I will say more about Celeste in a minute. Uh, I thought you might be interested in knowing that this is the 10th Elizabeth Miller Lecture. And Elizabeth has been the guiding force throughout. She provides not only philanthropic support, but also truly the vision of the series. When she founded this lecture series, she said to me that she wanted to, and I quote, open students' eyes to opportunity and inspire them to question what they really want to do with their lives. In her words, Elizabeth thought it would be invaluable for students to hear from women who had successfully taken different unexpected paths, in other words, to take risks. Over the past decade, we have heard stories of courage and commitment, of creativity and challenge, of innovation and inspiration. We have welcomed entrepreneurs, artists, writers, public policy experts, and change makers. Tonight, we continue this tradition with our speaker, Celeste Gudis. Celeste has been called a C-suite leader a staffing industry guru, and an entrepreneurial innovator. After spending close to 15 years in the fashion industry, she set out on her own, launching and recruiting her company 24-7 out of a single office in New York in 2000. When asked what it means to have an entrepreneurial spirit, Celeste once remarked, to me it's all about one's willingness to take risks. You really have to embrace the fear that can come with risk taking in order to build a successful business. And that's exactly what I did. I had a vision and I was willing to take the risk. Today, Celeste's company is, wait for it, a half billion dollar enterprise with 12 offices worldwide and is considered the third largest marketing and creative staffing firm in the United States. Clients include fashion, beauty, retail, and luxury companies around the world. And I understand that just yesterday, Celeste was named to the 2022 Global Power 150 Women in Staffing List. So congratulations, Celeste. <laughs> this honor is awarded to female trailblazers committed to the advancement of women in the workforce. I know Celeste is especially proud that she's a mother of three children, one of whom is currently a student here at Smith, and yes, she is present. Celeste has titled her talk tonight, Conscious Calibration, Shifting Your Mindset for Entrepreneurial Success. I look forward to a lively and engaging presentation. Please join me in welcoming Celeste. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to President McCartney and uh, Elizabeth. Um, this is an amazing thing you've done for the, for the college, so thank you. Um, so, All right, well, I have to tell you, it's kind of crazy to be back here after all these years in this setting, but um, there I am. 
you know, I am you, right? <laughs> Look how happy my parents are. <laughs> I graduated, you know, it was amazing. Um, so, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey from when I graduated to, to today. Um, so this is me today. This, this um, could be you. Um, and, um, you know, I founded 24-7, which is, uh, as Kathy mentioned, a global workforce solutions company. Um, that's the big title, but um, what we really do is match people with opportunities. Um, you know, our work cent centers around placing candidates in marketing, creative design, and, and technology roles. Uh, and, um, you know, we work with companies in many different ways, putting individual candidates into roles, you know, um, let, you know, giving them sort of, or, or placing freelancers, gig workers, or teams of people uh, into companies. Or sometimes we even work, you know, in our studio, which we can provide work for clients, you know, an outsourcing um, methodology. So um, as Kathy mentioned, we work with companies like Meta, Google, Sony, Airbnb, Gucci, LVMH, um, L'Oreal, and Cody, just to name a few. Um, but I kind of wanted to give you a sense. But it's not just big companies. We work with small startups um, and, and all companies in between. So, um, you know, we've been undergoing, you know, significant growth in the last, you know, five to ten years because of the digital transformation that every company is really going through. So we're kind of, you know, and, as, and it wasn't, you know, by not planning that to get us into the place where we're able to really work with companies in this. Um, because when I started the company, um, it was largely design talent and it was largely in the fashion industry. So um, we've been, you know, evolving and really, you know, as the marketplace evolves so that we could keep scaling the business. So, so uh, I want to show you a little bit about, so this is 24-7 and um, I just want to get a little bit of a sense. It's hard to tell the culture of a company, but um, it's a very vibrant organization. Um, we currently have about 400 internal employees, mostly recruiters, with the majority being women. Um, we work in the US, Canada, the Netherlands, and the UK. Um, it was very important to me that from the beginning our recruiters truly had some experience you know, in these fields so that they could really talk the talk and um, had the understanding of uh, you know, what, it's, what it truly takes to work um, in these roles. And, you know, I still think that's really important today, even though algorithms are doing more of the recruiting, I think that um, that sort of can't, that very high touch um, is the approach that we will continue to take. So the spirit and, and culture of the company is amazing. I'm so, I have so much gratitude for all the people that work at 24-7, one of which is here. Um, and, you know, it's, um, even though we've gone completely remote, so that was largely, you know, spurred on by COVID, but um, we've still been able to, to keep it. It's been an interesting experience managing folks, you know, in a totally remote you know, setting. But um, we've been able to, I think, keep, we have, still have some physical spaces where people gather. So, um, but it's a, it's a great group. And um, I can't believe, you know, that many of the people that started the company with me 22 years ago are still with the company today. So, um, love that. Uh, so I think people think that, you know, at least maybe my expectation was you start a company and it's just a straight arrow right up, right? But it's not. It's like, wow, it's not. But, you know, I think that it's more like the stock market, you know, with the highs and lows and um, it can be challenging. Um, you know, I think the, the one thing that I've observed, and I certainly experienced it, but I observed, you know, um, from other successful founders, is that they do share a mindset, and the mindset's really one of being able to deal with uncertainty, to really manage, you know, uncertainty. Because, you know, let's face it, there's always uncertainty in the world. I mean, look at um, where we are right now, right? You know, with inflation and the war and, you know, the macro world is little topsy-turvy yet, and yet unemployment remains quite low. So our business has actually remained quite strong through this, which is just, as I said, it's, you know, you, you deal with the uncertainty um, and um, you just continue to move forward, you know. So, um, but anyway, I just, uh, the reality is um, a little different. So um, 
I love this quote um, by Reid Hoffman, which is, I think at one point in one of our town halls, I even had sort of a, a visual of this, you know, of trying to fly the plane while you're building it. And um, so, you know, it's, um, I think it's a great analogy because, you know, after you've warded off all the naysayers and made the jump, you realize that I don't have all the parts, you know, <laughs> I don't even know. I, I don't even, you know, I need people, I need technology, I need, you know, all sorts of things, and I don't know how to assemble the parts, and you're flying, and, you know, everything's on you at that point. So, um, and, you know, I always wish I knew, you know, at the beginning of the week, um, you know, um, just what was going to happen, but at the end of the week, I kind of wish I did know what was going to happen at the beginning of the week. Sounds like a country song, sorry, but like that's so. <laughs> it. So mentors can come in very handy, um, you know, whether um, it's early stage or, you know, you're really trying to scale. Um, I realized I couldn't do everything by myself. So one of the key critical things that I did in the early days, in the founding days, as I say, is that, um, you know, I brought on the experts, you know, the team. I think there's a kid's book about that where all the specialists come in. <laughs> I used to read to Katie. But, you know, I did bring on the legal, the financial, um, and a team, you know, to build out technology. And that was probably the most important thing I ever did because it really let me set the company up from the ground up to be successful. Um, there's so many things in the beginning, like what kind of corporation are you going to be? You know, how are you going to fund it? Um, you know, and then if, you, if you can bring in, you don't have to bring them on, you know, full time. They can be consultants. Um, but I think that's a really critical piece, you know, when you're, whether, you, whether you're trying to scale a larger company or you're a sole proprietorship. So, um, and then, of course, I was the salesperson in the early days. Like, I was the one telling the story of 24-7. So, um, so, you know, again, I knew what my strengths were, and I knew that I had to bring in all those other, other um, helpful folks. Um, but as crazy as all that was, I found it exhilarating. It was amazing. Um, and it really, you know, I'm going to a little shout out for Smith. I have two shout outs, but I will tell you, it might be more for like the liberal arts education because, you know, I, all those things like leadership, writing, communicating, critically thinking, um, strategy, vision, problem solving, and, and even market analysis, um, you really can use it all when you're starting a company. Believe it or not, these are the skills you actually need because, as I said, you can bring in the specialists, you know. So, um, so anyway, I just want to kind of, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, why liberal arts education. So um, I think that I just want to put that in because um, for me, um, I didn't, again, I wasn't necessarily conscious about a lot of these things, but it was definitely seeping in and working. So, um, so I want to go into um, a little bit on the why of entrepreneurship before I get into some of the other areas. And because it kind of speaks to the why for me. Um, I'm going to talk about money because I'm going to start with that. Um, you know, I didn't, I really, when I was working in the fashion industry, there were ceilings there, you know. I didn't necessarily want to have a ceiling on the amount of money I could make or the how high, you know, a role I could get in that industry because there were glass ceilings, particularly for, for women and um, other minorities. But I do think that um, there was one of the things that I found frustrating, you know, in the, in the fashion industry. So I know money, you know, can be used in many ways, but I, I actually think that, you know, it's just the means, but freedom, you know, is what you're looking for. And so it's the freedom of time. Uh, you want to spend your life working. You want to, you know, spend your life doing, but you also want to enjoy your life. You know, you want to have time not to be working and to do things in your life. And so I, I think it's really, you know, and you, the ability to choose that time, you know, because if it's, if it's your company, you can do that. I mean, you make different choices all along the way. So. Um, and then um, freedom of relationships, I think this was probably um, maybe the biggest for me, and that you can create the kind of culture you want in a company. You know, it's about, you're the one in charge, you're doing it all. I mean, and if you want a, com a company that's collaborative and, you know, is um, you know, open to diversity and, uh, you know, you can create that, right? And it doesn't necessarily exist in every company in the world, but you can, you know, exist in yours. So. Um, so I think, you know, and also you can, you, you learn to work with um, certain, you know, what you the work with people you want to work with and partner with people you want to partner with. And, um, you know, like that to me is, 
th that doesn't happen for the most part when you're working for other corporations. So, and then of course developing your purpose and purpose, um, you know, is something I think it's important to all of us. Um, you know, this company is not just a job or career, it's really a vehicle for you. Um, you know, all sorts of things that relate to kind of the fundamental values and ideals in your life. Um, it allows you to, you know, who are you going to sponsor? You know, who, what kind of company is it? Um, you know, what organizations can you work with? Um, it, it really allows you to have a, a tremendous purpose on this planet um, because, you know, entrepreneurs are the greatest contributors to capabilities and, and communities all over the world. So, um, so I'm sort of wanting to give you the why first, but now I'm going to talk a little bit about my personal journey, which will be funny, I think, a little bit. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I promise I won't sing, but, you know, just a small town girl. Yeah, but um, anyway, a middle class girl from central New York. Um, I had great parents. I didn't come from any wealth. I, um, you know, my mom was a homemaker. My dad was the breadwinner. And we lived in a house that my dad and grandpa built from the ground up. Um, it was kind of like, you know, post-World War II, um, the American suburban life, you know. And um, so, um, but there wasn't a lot of gender stereotyping in our house. Um, you know, my mom, though she was a homemaker, um, she, she really, um, she was very instrumental in like teaching my sister and I, I had a big sister, I have a big sister, and um, you know, about money and you gotta keep your own checking account, it's independence, you know, so she was kind of pushing us in that direction. And we also had quite a bit of land, so my dad didn't care if I was a boy or girl, he just needed help really picking the vegetables, <laughs> the raspberries. <laughs> It was my job, and like I was driving like this big gravely tractor at like nine years old. So you probably room for social services to come into that. <laughs> but then you know, I kid you not. So it was just me and my big sister. Um, I was kind of interested in earning money though, so I was a big, big babysitter. But then at 15 years old, I talked my way into getting a job at a, a local hospital in the lab. Um, and I stayed there working holidays and weekends until I came to Smith. And believe it or not, toward the end, they even taught me how to draw blood as a phlebotomist, which is scary now that I think back. That <laughs> what were my qualifications then? I don't know. I just got to know the people. But um, so, so anyway, this is, um, you know, kind of want to give you the background. But these are the pictures I think you guys might enjoy. So. Um, I couldn't resist it. So on the far side there, um, that's me at eight years old visiting Smith with my sister who was a freshman at Smith. So note the suits that we all have <laughs> and the camera and my socks. I really am quite um, stylish, I will say. Um, so um, then, you know, fast forward to the middle shot was I went, Throughout my time at Smith, I worked in a clothing store. And I don't know if anybody's been here for a long time in Northampton, but it was called Sienna. Do you remember that? Yes, I worked there all the time when I was here. And I had a great time. The people were lovely, and, but um, spent a lot of time there. I liked, liked the cars, too. And then, of course, Laura Scales House, <laughs> you know, where I lived in. Um, funny thing, I lived there now, you know, when I was here. My sister lived in Laura Scales' house, too. Now my daughter Katie's in Scales House, so it's kind of a legacy. And then I was thinking, I should tell Kathy, you know, I should write a blog or something about it because I have seen it on all these different generations, you know, and lived it in a way and seen such change come through the house that I thought, you know, it's like 50 plus years scary that I've been watching Lauren Scales <laughs> intermittently, but still, okay. Um, so um, I was an econ gov double major and. You know, I thought I was going to go into finance or law um, because that's what you did, you know, with econ and gov. But, um, you know, again, another the second shout out for Smith. Um, I call it sort of the women's mystique, women's college mystique. Um, I probably wasn't really conscious at the time, but because um, I had no idea what, you know, what life was going to be like after college. But, um, 
you know, but my beliefs were in a formative state. So um, I wasn't consciously thinking, oh, I'm becoming a terrific leader, or how much am I enjoying working with other women, or this is amazing, I'm building my individuality and my confidence in who I'm becoming, and I'm, I'm such a good critical thinker. And no, I didn't, I didn't know any of that, but um, what I do know is that I think it was trickling in, <laughs> too. So, um, and um, so, We'll just move along into the Celeste journey here. But I, um, I spent my junior year at London School of Economics. Um, but I will tell you, London had a big impact on me. I, it kind of changed my thinking, who I was. You know, small town girl goes to big city, right? And the big city was like, wow. I mean, think great fashion, the music scene. Oh, I have my, a good friend of mine's here. But think the clash, Sex Pistols, you know. I was young once, you know, Elvis Costello, <laughs> the police, the pretenders, you know, I immersed myself. I saw a lot of this live music. It was amazing. Loved it. And I, but I had to go, but I went by myself. It wasn't a Smith program. And I had to find my own housing, a job to help sustain myself. And um, it was kind of the beginning of some independence. But I came back and I graduated from Smith. And um, actually, Maya Angelou spoke at our, our graduation, which was lovely and quite beautiful, you know. So I kind of hold that. But then I was riding home back to Syracuse in the back seat of my parents' Chevy. <laughs> I kid you not, another song. But um, and after graduation, you know, with no set plans, <laughs> I um, I was sitting in the back seat. I, I have this just this memory of riding back, and I was like oh, I have to figure something out here. <laughs> I don't think this is going to work, you know. So um, I had, the expectation was that I was going to go back and continue to law school. I had gotten into a couple of schools, including Syracuse, and or going to finance, because what else, again, as I said, you would do with the econ gov. Um, but I mean, times were different then, and career paths were more set um, and more narrow. And entrepreneurship was never really talked about, you know. It just was... It's kind of rogue and maverick back then, you know, to be an entrepreneur. So, um, but the more I thought about it, I just couldn't see myself following one of those preset paths. So this is when I kind of made my first life-changing mindset shift, I would say. I wasn't necessarily that I followed my passion, but I was following my interests. So, um, and I knew, um, you know, that if I didn't kind of do it then, you know, I'd start following what other people, particularly right at that point, was my parents, what they were expecting of me. I know it's hard because we love them and don't want to disappoint them, but, you know, I, learned, I leaned into that fear of disappointing others um, and not worrying about what others thought of me. So starting some, finally starting, I think, some belief in, in myself. Um, so I set off for New York, oh my God, and, um, started my career in fashion. And I have to say, you know, I got a, a job right out of Women's Wear Daily, the rag trade, $13,000 a year. It was just an amazing experience. <laughs> that industry is crazy, by the way. I, I don't know if I'd recommend it, but it, you know, I certainly loved it for a period of time. And, um, you know, I, um, thanks to my good friend Liz and her family, who I adored, um, let me stay at her place in New Jersey for several months so, you know, I could get myself rolling. And i um, so, so grateful for that. Um, so I, although I really fancied myself to be a designer, I, you know, creative designer, I was, I was in roles that were more business oriented, but working at companies like The Gap, Liz Claiborne, Alexander Julian, these are probably brands you never heard of, but it's okay. Um, I loved the buzz and excitement of the industry. Um, but I started to realize that my strengths, you know, were really around people, leadership, collaboration, organizational development, team building, culture building, networking. Um, so, so during this corporate career in fashion, which lasted a while, so I want to kind of give you some perspective. It was like 15, 20 years, but um, I found that I was always networking with talent, um, you know, helping folks find jobs, the creative industries, whether fashion, beauty, advertising, publishing, they used a lot of freelancers. Um, but it was all haphazard off the books. People often didn't get paid. Um, there, was no safe, there was no safety net for them, you know, they, um, there were no medical benefits, et cetera. So, um, and everything about recruitment seemed really old school to me back then. It was kind of gray and, 
you know, like personnel, right? That was always, you had to go to the personnel office. And, and it was like, you know, um, like think manpower, Kelly girl, secretarial roles type thing. So, um, so you know, I, I kept thinking like, what do we do? Can we make this experience for the user, the candidate, the person looking for work, and the company that was looking for talent? Can we make this like a little more interesting? And um, so, and also, you know, what you don't realize about um, finding work, it's the most stressful time in people's lives, you know? Finding work, changing jobs. Um, I'm sure you're all feeling it. If you're seniors, what are you gonna do next year if you're not going on to school? So, um, so I kind of love the helping people move forward in their lives. Finding work, you know, is, um, again, I just would tell you that, um, that, that what I've learned just talking to people about the experience, you have to include kind of the whole family in the experience of helping them, particularly if they're making a life move or a geographic move. Um, but I was good at it, you know, and I loved it. And I was like, it was just something that um, I found out, you know, that the, the type of um, hard and soft skills um, that were needed, just, I was like a matchmaker. I felt like a queen. It was great. But this is, I was doing it on the side. I wasn't really doing it as my main job. So, but should I leave a successful fashion career um, and start like the modern headhunter, you know, it was like, so I realized that all along, I was, now I realize it's kind of formulating my big idea, but, um, but you know, before I move on too far, I just kind of want to give you a few notes. If you're thinking about, you know, potential entrepreneurship, how to formulate your ideas, but um, you know, let your mind wander, you know, pay attention to when you're getting your best ideas, when, the, when you're, you're thinking about something that really excites you. Um, and ask why a lot. Why is something done a certain way? Could it be done differently? Could it be done better? Um, you know, um, and critical, write your ideas down. I don't care on your phone, you know, however, like next to your dreams that you record at night, <laughs> probably not. But, um, you know, I, I think write it down because you never know, even though it might not be something so relevant, there might be like a stream of thought or like a, some, you know, sort of a theme going through what you're thinking about. Um, and then, of course, all the what questions, right? What's the need? Um, what, you know, what are the, what's the time, money, and resources needed to really move this idea to action? Um, what are the closest services or products out there that, um, and I'm sure that this beautiful center, um, you know, has lots of things going on that, you know, kind of mirrors what I'm saying. But, um, and if you can figure out to do some testing of, the, of your idea, that's, you know, even better. Um, so as I was about to make the leap into the modern hunter, I was once again confronted, though, with a lot of naysayers. Um, you know, people, I, I didn't, you didn't go to business school. Like, why would you do this? And, um, you, you know, you can't, you've never had experience running an entire business. Um, so my internal messaging was starting to fire up as well because, um, you know, at that point, I had, I don't know if I mentioned this already, but I had my first baby. So I'm going to skip that part, but um, <laughs> I forgot that. But no, but I had my daughter Ellie in just, a, you know, in 1999. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Um, and I had also had a partner, Stuart. And um, so, um, but, um, but, you know, I thought, because I did, I had a great job, but I mean, so now I had family responsibilities. So should I upset that apple cart to really start? Uh, so I pushed ahead and I took the leap. Um, so I, I want to talk a, just really a little bit more on purpose because, you know, I believe that your purpose, um, that your purpose follows your passion. Um, and my passion grew out of a combination of my interests, my strengths, and some hard work. Um, but it took a while for me to even figure out what I was passionate about. And I don't know if you guys ever, like, or people ask you, like, what are you passionate about? And, you know, if you asked me when I was in my 20s, I might have said, like, MTV. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know, you know. It's like, on the other hand, my sister became passionate about chemistry, um, you know, at an early age and went on to become a very well-known scientist. So people have different, you know, types. But you don't have to go looking for it. It'll find you. And it'll find you often just coming at you, like, from intense work you're putting into something that you have an interest about, you know, and then it becomes passionate, you know. So it's not something you have to worry about. I just bring it up because even now some people will come up and ask me, like, 
you know, what, what are you going to do next? Like, what are you passionate about? And it throws me off. You know, I'm like, my yellow labs, I mean, where are they? I know. <laughs> but I, you know, I just, it's just one of those things. It'll find you. Um, but I, you know, when I um, started 24-7, I wanted to make the experience of finding work less daunting, more personal, more rewarding. And as I, as I said, our company began by innovating the way creative talent found jobs and grew their careers in New York. But I did become passionate about building 24-7. There's no doubt about it. You know, I, I loved it. And, um, and yes, my purpose followed in that we were making the lives of people looking for work better and we were powering companies by finding them this great talent. So like kind of that's the purpose story on the level of, you know, but, um, and by the way, I threw the stat on one of the earlier slides, I glossed over it, but I just got this from our IT department, but we placed, we found 250,000 people jobs. Like that's a staggering number if you think about that, you know, so, um, but turns out the purpose story went even deeper, right? Because um, I had created a unique workplace and, and um, where women were positioned to, you know, really achieve financial independence and that brought on, you know, autonomy over their lives. They were often the chief breadwinners in their families. Um, and I kind of created a bubble or a cocoon in a sense. Again, I didn't do it knowingly. I did it just because it felt right. And I think some of what I picked up at Smith and uh, in other places, it just felt right. And um, so, you know, there was equality of pay, enhanced family leave, career advancement. And when I was, you know, 20 years of being CEO, we didn't have one um, sexual harassment complaint, nothing. You know, so I just kind of want to give you a sense, well, it's certainly not you know, Nirvana, it was a, a great place for, for women to work, um, still is actually. Um, so um, I'm just going to mention too that um, I had twins, Katie and James, 12 months after launching 24-7. Now this I don't recommend, okay, because so, now I had three babies under 22 months old, a new company, um, a partner, a couple dogs, and my aging parents. So. I st I'm still standing though, so <laughs> that might be my biggest um, career success of all. But um, so, um, you know, but so many women have had kids and had children at 24 7, and they still are, and we celebrate all the milestones. And so that's been a wonderful thing. Uh, but I only really began to realize I had created a bit of a bubble for, for um, women. and. Um, it was when I sold to the company or portion of the company to private equity in 20, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2016. Um, I thought, wow, there's a lot of gender bias still out there because now, you know, I was really sitting on in different types of meetings and um, largely without um, any diversity or any women on, you know, in these groups. So, um, and and even along the way, there were little things that would happen, you know, when. I hope it doesn't happen to any of you, but it might because things are changing, but it's not perfect where, you know, I'd be sitting in a room and with maybe a couple senior male colleagues of mine and we'd bring in bankers or something and I could always tell if they were directing the whole conversation to my male colleagues and not to me. They hadn't done any homework on the firm, right? So, Jack, you're out of here. But I would politely take, you know, finish the meeting and there we go. But that happened with insurance brokers and bankers and you know, so I, some of that was kind of amusing, but, you know, particularly in the world of finance, you know, and, and I think one of the things that's, you know, really worth another talk about is really how to, you know, find capital if you're, uh, particularly for women and minorities, and, you know, if you're just starting out, um, there's a lot to that, but, you know, I, I don't know, I can't get to everything tonight, <laughs> another time Elizabeth will. So, um, so I, I want to just, again, these are just a few questions to ask yourself. Um, you know, so if you can think about your purpose, um, you know, what brings you joy? What are you good at? What are you known for? Um, how do you want to serve the world? Um, and how can you connect your talents to service? Um, you know, I think that, um, let's see. Um, you know, I, I, these, these questions aren't new or unique, but they're timeless, right? And they can just kind of help you focus in. And, you know, I think as you take on new experiences and challenges, it's kind of like your personal GPS, right? You know, to kind of keep coming back to that. 
And F. Scott Fitzgerald said, it's never too late to become what you might have been. So if you find yourself <laughs> down a path that isn't your own, you can always stop, right? And just start from where you are. So I love that. But all right. And this slide had to put it in. And I, I heard tomorrow is Julia Child's day here. Is that right? So that's exciting. Um, nice. Um, so remember that being different is a superpower. Don't forget that, you know. Um, embrace it. Don't, you know, thinking differently. You know, as a woman, we're so often conditioned to fit in, to conform in appearance and behavior. But well-behaved women ra rarely make history. Um, so female confidence is probably the biggest inhibitor, to, you know, to the progression of success. So stand up for yourself. It takes mindful practice, though. Um, so set a time aside for it, just as you would exercise, sleep, and other self-care um, choices. So, um, you know, great exercise tying into the purpose slide um, before this is, you know, write your personal manifesto. Write it down. Um, where, what are your values? Where do you see yourself? What will your life be like? And do this, like, with detail. And I'm going to explain why. But, you know, like, what are you wearing? Like, when you leave Smith, do you have any idea? Like, what do you want your life to be? And where do you want it? And put it somewhere you can review daily, weekly. And, and it's going to be an invaluable touchstone as you move forward. And I say that because... I, I do believe in the power of intention, right? And for all of us, um, you know, I had this dream, you know, way back, just when I was still in the fashion industry, and I kept envisioning that I was going to have a company that was, you know, going to be on, you know, an industrial-style building with a cool architecture on a cobblestone street full of really interesting people I was going to work with. And you know what? Our first office was in Soho, New York on a cobblestone street in a cool building, industrial in nature with really cool people. And it was great. So, I mean, I had that vision for a long time and it was very specific, right? And, but you, you don't realize you're, you're building on your intentions, you know? So, um, so remember that, um, you know, that just, um, you're awesome, um, and you know I think just keeping a positive mindset here and really thinking about um, you, again life changes, all kinds of things change. But if you can keep that you know sort of intention of where you want to go, I think it's really important. So back to the the title of this lecture, but I'm just going to do a little bit on some mindset shifts that I think are required of the entrepreneur because I feel that. Um, I, I think about these and I've been, um, I've experienced them. So, and I've experienced also people that haven't quite made some of these shifts and it's been harder for them. So, um, the growth mindset of the entrepreneur is to recognize that, you know, our brains, you know, they're, they're wired for fear, right? Prehistorically and, and it's profoundly, you know, courageous to act to embrace the unknown and move forward in belief. Um, in the thoughts we think or the house we live in, and you can choose how to think um, and relearn how to think. Uh, but be conscious of releasing limiting beliefs. Um, you know, sometimes they're implanted by others, um, and that's historically, um, and then reinforced, unfortunately, by us. But um, so where others see risk, you're going to begin to see opportunity. Um, when you hear that voice in your head that tells you, uh, you know, you're not good at this, you're not able to do that. Recognize it for what it is. It's, it's, um, it's not yours, silence it. Um, the only way to really silence it is to learn, right? To um, apply knowledge, keep going. Um, but the voice in your head and the naysayers are gonna want you to hold on to security because that's what we're, you know, sort of, we wanna do that. We wanna hold on to security. Um, we don't wanna take risk. Um, and, and like, for example, with 24-7, at each stage of growth of scaling the company from, you know, $5 million in revenue up, up the ladder, you, I had to take risk. I had to take risk personally, and I had to take risk. It wasn't, you know, I calculated the risk. It wasn't like I'm arbitrarily going out and throwing, you know, money around or something. But, but it's still risk, you know, and I, I go back to, in, um, to, you know, I mean, for a long time, we were self-funded. I mean, I started the money, you know, just bootstrapped out of my own personal savings. Um, eventually, you know, got some bank loans and things, um, some asset-based lending. But, um, 
But my name, my house, my everything was guaranteeing this company for up until I really brought private equity in. And so like in 2008, 2009, that was, that was a very um, difficult period, right? You know, for, for, all, for those of you that, you know, were little wonderful, you know, children at the time. But that was, a, you know, economically that was, it wasn't the Great Depression, but it was almost as bad, you know. So, you know, I'm thinking, oh, am I going to lose the house, you know, or something? But, but again, you know, because of sort of the calculated risk, um, it, we made it through. And, um, um, but you, I would never be standing here today with the success of 24-7 if um, I didn't see, you know, opportunity instead of just, you know, worrying about personal security and security in general. So it's important to adopt the view that opportunity is abundant everywhere. Um, an abundance mindset will help you spot ideas. Um, and it allows you to also kind of be unfettered by conventional wisdom and paradigms so you can see out of the box that where maybe the future is coming. Um, so and also the, a, a piece of this too is the, um, you know, I, I try to get people out of the competition. You know, yes, you may be competing out there, but if you can collaborate and you have the mind open for networking and collaboration, um, you know, you don't know who's going to be out there. And, and your end, you know, if you can, sometimes you can create value by you're coming in with different ideas, but you have the same end user, right? And so you can collaborate and just ways to think about how to grow. It doesn't always have to be by, you know, building just your business. And of course, no time for complacency. Um, you know, keep that growth mindset. And I think at every 24-7 town hall, too, I, I, I think, you know, I did speak about growth and why, and why it's important not to stay static, why it's important to move the company forward, because it gives everyone in the company more opportunity, right? Because if you're just staying static, you know, where do people go? How do you keep them? You know, how do you keep them valued? How do you keep them interested in, in the company? And also your clients, your customers are not staying static. I mean, we're in the most revolutionary time with technology happening right now. So you have to constantly grow and, and, and move your, your, um, your company forward. So, um, all right, guys, your entrepreneurship journey begins now. Um, I'm, I'm going to be watching. <laughs> So Smith has some, uh, so what to do, right, in the short run, because I want to come back to Smith and take some of these classes, but Smith has some great IDP classes on entrepreneurism, leadership, design thinking, and innovation. Now, I've done some work in design thinking with IBM a few years ago. I loved it, you know, it was amazing. So um, there's mentorship programs, the alumni networks. This, um, you know, the Jill Kerr Conway Innovation Entrepreneurship Center, amazing. I mean. I, you know, so these are resources you guys have here, so take advantage of them, right, Katie? <laughs> so I don't mean silly. Um, so, um, but your job is to learn, learn, learn while you're here. Um, and um, I would find opportunities to lean into fear a little bit, right? So, you know, if you're not comfortable public speaking, then publicly speak, right? If you don't feel financially literate, take something in that sense. You know, if you're, you know, need technology, whatever it is. Um, uh, lean into it, but the most important thing I think you can lean into is our leadership roles, however you can find them, wherever you can find them, in an organization, in a house, in a, you know, club, in a, wherever you can, um, because what I've found is that I'm actually mentoring some startups right now, and um, the, the leadership quotient, that piece is hard for people, and particularly if you're just out of school, you know, I think sometimes being out in um, working for companies for a while, it, it can provide, or you know, how, wherever you're going on to school, um, can provide more opportunities for leadership growth. Because I do think um, sometimes folks struggle, you know, um, without that experience. But um, so, you know, I again, um, I think uh, you know, wherever you can find that that leadership and. Um, Start building networks, you know. Are you on LinkedIn? Are you guys on LinkedIn? Are you connecting with alumni there? Are you following business leaders you admire? Um, what organizations are they part of? Can you join them too? What platforms exist for budding business ideas like you might have? Um, and, um, you know, there's organizations like entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, it's a lot to say, groups on LinkedIn and, um, Things like the American Marketing Association. I love marketing, but you know, you, they have all kinds of things um, 
just online that you can attend meetings and meetups. So, um, and um, be open-minded, you know, about your strengths and weaknesses. Really talk to yourself, like, where do I not feel comfortable or where do I, you know, um, you know, if you're taking a job after you graduate, you know, are you choosing to work for a brand or organization that aligns with your future vision? Or, um, you know, think about that or, you know, it also can help you, you know, you know save um, time, money, things along the way to pick up some of this experience out there before you venture off um, onto your individual, uh, well, hopefully entrepreneurship journeys, because I am just a big believer, as you can tell on that. So, um, oh, the, well, the world does need you. Um, the world needs change, and it's changing, but it um, could certainly use your voices in it. And I'm going to leave with just a couple words, um, and then I'll, I think we have, yeah, we have time for a couple questions, yeah. That's it. Um, you know, so embrace who you are, believe in yourself, keep a growth mindset, set your intentions, defy the naysayers because they're all around you, <laughs> um, and dream big. So um, thanks all so much. It was great being here. I'll give you a little piece. Um, so, yeah. I'm open to any questions, and um, if not, that's okay too. So, <laughs> listen. Okay, so I have yeah. children, kind of ages, just just graduated from college. Um, at what point do you think it makes sense to kind of learn on somebody else's dime versus <laughs> taking your own personal risk? Yeah. So I I I think. Um, I think right out of school, unless you have this amazing idea, but you know, the majority of entrepreneurs are not on, in Silicon Valley starting something out of the garage. Or whatever. I mean, that's just not the reality. It's the, it's the nice, it's the exciting stories, right? So my feeling is I would, I would, get, some, I would get some experience um, because what, again, I'm, I'm, I, right now I'm mentoring a very young entrepreneur who's amazing, but I'm, I'm seeing her really challenged with the leadership piece as well, you know, because she's got, um, um, you know, her workforce is multi-aged and um, she's really struggling with trying to, you know, um, to lead, right? Because you're not, and when you're not just leading your company from within, you've got to lead to the outside world too, because you're the voice of the company. So, um, so I don't know that there's a set amount of time, but I, I think getting some experience is important. I mean, I'm a perfect example. I'm, you know, it was almost 20 years of work before I started 24-7. Um, so I, it, it, I don't think it's a set rule, but I do, I think getting out there and you can see all the mistakes being made too, <laughs> which I did as well. So, you know, it kind of informed what I wanted to do. So, yeah. Um, all right. Yes. Yeah, so I really, um, yeah, um, connected with you saying that you kind of look for your own path. And I feel like that's kind of what I've been doing over my senior year, over my college career. But mostly, I think sophomore year started to take more, like, um, one, like a job and all this kind of pressure started. I started, I guess, kind of not balancing security and um, risk, more like either looking at one or looking at the other. So how do you think, do you have any advice on managing risk and security more? Yeah, that's, that's um, great. I think, you know, even some of the questions that I've put up here tonight, and I'm happy to share the presentation if you guys, you know, would like to reference that, but, um, you know, I, I think that, um, I think you, you really want to follow your interests, right? So and keep that in mind. Um, uh, you know, beyond that, um, you know, I, mean, I, I understand everybody has different financial circumstances, you know, whether they, and I'm very, uh, you know, I get that. So, um, but I, if you can follow your interests, um, and really think about what your interests are, right? And um, I think that's, you know, kind of where I would lean. Um, and if you, you know, I mean, in the early, I think 
it's easier to not have security before you start other life choices, right? So whether you're just starting a family, doing other things, you know. So now is the time, I think, if you can take a little more risk, but follow and you know do something that you really feel strongly about. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Naya. Um, oh, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> so am I. Yeah. I know you covered this a little bit in your talk, but I was wondering if you could give us some kind of tangible baby steps in establishing those leadership skills. It's easy when you're at Smith to, maybe not easy, but you can join a club or you can take a leadership position in your house. But how do you really start exhibiting and developing those interpersonal leadership skills? Yeah. I think, I think the, um, it's interesting is it's kind of, it's really about building consensus in a group, um, you know, and I think that's, um, so, you know, you build consensus and then you, um, but yet, uh, you know, if there's a mission, you kind of have to drive the mission forward as best you can, you know, with differing viewpoints. Um, so I think, um, you know, just being cognizant that you're, you've got, you know, people with differing viewpoints, but how do you bring them together? So that's a, it's, you know, you do it by really articulating the vision of the organization or whatever, wherever you're, you know, whatever the group is. Um, if you can keep articulating the vision and you have, um, and, yet, and you try to bring in representative voices, but you're still on the path to the vision, I think where it's hardest is when there is no vision and you've got differing voices and, you know, you're trying to meld that together. And it, um, and, but I have to be honest, like one of the most, um, Exciting things to me was really, um, you know, building this team, building the company. One of the most painful things to me was also building this team and building this company because people are challenging and um, they, you know, everybody's different and has different mindsets. And some of the things I, I found really, I almost had to go through at some points, you know, like oh, I would call it some kind of emotional detachment, you know. I was still really, you know, positive about, you know, where the, say, for example, with the company where it was going. And yet, you know, it's still at some point, you know, um, it, it's a job for folks and they leave jobs, right? So after you've invested all this time and money and effort and you're so close and working so close together, they find another opportunity and you want to be supportive because oftentimes it's the right move for them. But it's hard, right? Because you've become a family and you're losing people. So my only point is it's not, um, the, the people part of it, of leadership is, um, you know, can be challenging. Um, but I think it's really, our, again, back to our, our, if there's a vision, you gotta keep articulating it and keep driving the group toward that. Um, that's what's really kept me going too um, through the years. So, yeah. Um, yes, yeah. So it sounds like you've had a really rewarding experience. I'm curious, at this point in your life, looking back, is there anything that you wish you had done differently while you were a student? Oh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I wish I had taken advantage. I wished I had, well, one thing too, you know, I thought it was like I was doing the double major and that was a lot of classes to take. So then I didn't really get, I wish I took more outside that than I did because I was just econ gov, econ gov, you know. And so I didn't take anthropology or sociology, things that I'm interested in, you know, and also what Smith offers like right now with this, Center. I mean, I don't recall everything Smith had, but you know, I certainly um, didn't engage enough with organizations and things here. Kind of got in my own bubble too, you know. And I, I wish I had branched out more. I don't know if that makes sense, to you guys. But by your senior, you kind of like in your niche with friends, and um, you know, you, you're getting comfortable and you're thinking beyond. But um, for me, I, I think it was more about um, getting a broader education, you know look at everything than I did, yeah, so. Yeah, that's, um, I walk back along the campus now with, um, you know, I think about what Smith did for me, and it really did so much, but at the time, you know, you, you couldn't have told me then, but, um, but, <laughs> but now I, um, I value it, so, um, yeah, maybe it's just because getting older or something, I don't know, but um, yeah, so melancholy coming back, but fun, so, um, and I was, um, I don't, so we'll stop there, yeah, I could keep wax profane here, so, but yes, yeah, so, anybody else? Um, 
All right, well, thank you so much. I um, enjoyed talking with you. Yeah, so, so. Thank you. Yay. Hi, everyone. I'm Renee Hevlo. I am the Director of Operations and Special Programs for the Conway Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I want to thank you for a wonderful talk. And Elizabeth, thank you for sponsoring this. We have a reception set up for you across the hall and copies of in the company of women, inspiration and oh, yeah. advice from over 100 makers, artists, and entrepreneurs recommended by Celeste. So, love the book, by us. the way. It's so Great. nice. Yeah, Thank so. You. <laughs> You're welcome.